The story of why Fury Road didn't sound great before my arrival is made clearer by understanding that no one seemed to want to speak or utter the unutterable to George Miller. Abandon this effort and start from scratch. This is a film that had been in post for a year and a half already. That's blasphemy, right? Tell your director, one of the world's greatest filmmakers, that the soundtrack he'd been working on for a year and a half wasn't very good and needed to be redesigned. I dreaded having to bear this news, but began going through the traditional motions of working on the sound for the film. As is common practice, I had spotting sessions with George Miller. We ran the film on the Avid as one does in traditional fashion, but what was untraditional about George was the way he talked about his film. Rather than get granular about the sounds that he did want, he'd talk about what the scenes were saying. He'd talk about what the drama meant to imply. He'd talk about subtext. He'd use all that squishy ephemeral language that you hear in things like acting classes and writing seminars. And then he would say, Mark, how does sound support that? How does sound support what I'm trying to do dramatically on the screen? That left us wide latitude to create an experiment in ways that we don't normally have. I would have daily contact with George in a variety of forms after the spotting sessions. George, uh, among other things, would send me video notes regularly from the cutting room like this one. So I'm going to show you this. It's not particularly compelling, but I thought if you're a geek about Mad Max like I am, at least you'll get to see George in his element. And this is, I, w I saw, when I arrived in Sydney, they handed me a four terabyte brick that had all of George's year and a half's worth of video notes to the team. And I was supposed to catch up on 25 hours of video notes to get up to speed on the movie. So here's George in the cutting room giving us some notes. For the hour rating, we um, adding kind of sweeteners uh, for uh, with visual effects, uh, but we're not. It's not just constant spurting blood. There's specific sounds which we need to hear, uh, which which will help us see really what is going to be so brief and impressionistic. The sound will help us see it. And for instance, here's one moment where when this. So you get the idea. There's, there's George at the screen and sort of uh, dictating to us um, what he wanted for that scene. Um, here he's talking about how we're going to deal with, in fact, the R rating that he fought the studio for for some time. The studio wanted a PG with the hopes that it would introduce the film to a wider audience. George wanted to protect the integrity of his film. The studio actually cut a PG-13 version and previewed it and got lower scores uh, than we did with the R-rated version. So the PG version was abandoned. Once uh, we had all sort of signed off on that idea that this was going to be an R-rated movie, George opted to sort of amp up what little graphic violence we have. I mean, I don't think, I know there's a lot of action, but I don't think this is a particularly violent movie. Um, but there is a little bit of sort of blood and, and that kind of stuff. And once we got the sign off on the R rating, um, he, we actually started adding in blood spurts on gunshots and things like that. And that's what that note was about, in fact, was the sounds that I would make for blood spurts. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about the pre... Who here knows what an audience preview is? I mean, you know movies get taken out into the field. and Okay, good, so this is not a foreign concept to you. One of the other ways George would communicate with me was by voice memo, like this one. Hi Matt, hi Mark. Uh, just um, having uh, reviewed and finished off the crowds in Spool 7 as we have done in Spool 1 Spool uh, with, real, with in case Peter you... Miller, um, there is a moment that you in fact mentioned Mark which is uh, you know, that, that, you know, why it's so easy to take over the Citadel. And I, I realise probably now that we've got the crowd saying, let them up, let them up, there is a moment where we can take a little bit more time for that line of the so-called brake man or the winchman way up on top to... You get the idea. Um, I loved these voice memos that I got from George because I do this all the time. 
Um, it's sort of a, a part of an obsession I have with never losing a good idea by documenting it the minute I have it. Uh, George did this regularly. I have a collection of 248 of those voice memos from George on a wide-ranging uh, set of topics. Um, he would do the generally, he's, this is a very complex film and his day was crammed with um, DI, visual effects, sound, ADR, scoring, and these notes were usually generated in his car on the drive home at midnight. It was the only time he had a minute to sort of let down and, and let the brain flow freely, and then he'd dictate into his iPhone and then he'd, he'd just email them to me. <laughs> 